I'm Elise Giuliano, and I'm happy to introduce our speakers today. But uh, first, I will mention that unfortunately, uh, Charles King could not make it because he um, became sick today. So, um, in place of Charles, we'll have Lincoln Mitchell uh, speaking on the role of the US, Russia, and EU. <clears throat> So first I'd like to introduce Christopher Borgen, who is Associate Dean of International Studies and a Professor of Law at St. John's University here in New York City. Um, he teaches international law as well as national security law and contracts. And he is co-founder of St. John's Center for International and Comparative Law and a co-founder of Opinio Juris, a leading international law blog. Chris is, uh, was a participant in and a lead author of a study conducted by the New York City Bar Association on the situation in Moldova um, related to obviously the, the secessionist situation there, but from the point of view of um, <coughs> what the international law, how international law can interpret and uh, think about the issue there. And that uh, report is available, I believe, on your website. It's linked, no? And, okay, and it's, it's called Thawing of Frozen Conflict, Legal Aspects of the Separatist Crisis in Moldova. Chris? I'm also going to have a, a, a few PowerPoint slides um, to uh, deal with some of the material of what I'd like to do today. First, I, I, I would like to thank uh, Alex and Lincoln for uh, inviting me to participate today. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. Um, in terms of thinking about external actors, the external actors that I'll be talking about a little bit uh, are both not only external states, but also the international community as a whole, particularly in terms of normative concerns, the role of international law in relation to frozen conflicts. And I'll be focusing in particular on uh, the history of what's been happening in Moldova, but as a way of just getting a broader discussion going of uh, how to think about the relationship of law to the frozen conflicts. So if 20 years ago we were talking about the Sinatra Doctrine, um, I want to sort of counterpose what I'll call the Tina Turner question, um, which is what's law got to do with it? Um, and ask whether or not international law really does have much to say here, and if so, how? So the three things I would like to do in the next few minutes are to briefly mention a little bit of background in regards to the Transnistrian conflict. I assume that most people here are going, know the history better than I do. Um, but then really focus in on the international legal issues of self-determination, secession, and sovereignty. And particularly how international lawyers look at these questions and define the terms of self-determination and secession. And then finally, broadening out from that, ask a few questions or make a few points about the uses and abuses of international legal rhetoric in relation to highly contested political topics such as secessionist conflicts. So the quick overview of the Transnistrian conflict. Um, once again, uh, this is sort of a map of Transnistria. It's a small strip of land uh, on the other side of the Nistru River. Um, the early stages of the conflict, as many of you would probably know, began with, you know, prior to the end of the Soviet Union, but really during a time in which the, Moldo Mol the Moldavian Soviet Socialist Republic um, was seeking greater sovereignty within the USSR, Transnistria beginning to declare separation from Moldova, sort of a series of sort of counter moves during around 1989, 1990, which then led to sort of dueling declarations of independence in 1991 with Moldova declaring independence, full independence from the USSR on August 27, 1991. The Transnistrian Moldova, Moldovan Republic, or the TMR as I'll call it, declaring independence from Moldova on September 6, 1991, and the USSR dissolving in December 1991. This led to armed conflict, uh, particularly in the summer of 1992. Um, leading to a ceasefire, which I think it's interesting to note that the ceasefire was signed not between Moldova and the TMR, but between Moldova and Russia uh, on July 21st, 1992. Um, we can possibly talk about that in question and answer if that is of interest to you in regards to issues of third party states or external actors. But I want to talk more about or think more about the situation since 1992. The de facto separation of Transnistria and Moldova the Russian troops in Transnistria, 
Um, and the rounds of increasing and decreasing tensions while there's mediation by the OSCE. There have been the talks, the five plus two talks, um, which started, stopped, and just now have started again as of two days ago. Um, and within that, during that time, there's also been the issues of Kosovo's independence and the August war regarding South Ossetia and Abkhazia, which I will discuss in a little bit towards the end of my, towards the end of my talk. So I want to focus really on self-determination, secession, and sovereignty as legal concepts and how international lawyers think about this and the ways in which sometimes the legal rhetoric or the attempt at having precise legal rhetoric is sometimes lost in the midst of a heated political debate. Um, the, the term that I've used for this is kind of like the, the legal concepts become a little bit like a snowflake in a blast furnace um, when you try to talk about complex legal con you know, uh, complex legal topics in the midst of, you know, life and death situations um, regarding, you know, the possible dismemberment of a country. But, but let's talk about whether or not that can actually have an effect on those situations. So self-determination began really not as a legal concept, but as a political one. Um, it was in Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. Um, as you may know, uh, after he mentioned the idea of the self-determination of peoples, um, in the Paris Peace Conference, he actually had made a comment along with the other negotiators of, you know, who knew there were so many peoples? Because, you know, everybody was sort of coming and asking for statehood. And Woodrow Wilson actually subsequently apologized to the Congress of the United States um, for talking about the self-determination of peoples because it just turned into such a huge headache. Um, it started off essentially as a political concept, but there was an attempt to give it some type of actual legal form. That is something which actually had some substance to it. Um, and it moved from a political rhetoric to being a le recognized legal right, particularly in the International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant for Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Those two treaties are considered essentially the founding documents of modern human rights law. And it says in Article I of both of those treaties, all peoples have the right of self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. That is great sounding language, but it doesn't really do much to tell you exactly what that means. The fear that states have had is, does self-determination mean that a people, whatever that is, has the right to, or it can, dismember a state? So that's, if I could put it, sort of the political fear, the political concern. I can refashion this into a more legal question, which is that is there a tension between self-determination and territorial integrity? That is the pre-existing territorial integrity of states. And take that legal question and then unpack it into two further questions, which is how the international community has dealt with this as a legal question, as legal issues. First, who has a right of self-determination? That's the what is a people question. And second, once we decide who has a right of self-determination, what would a remedy require or allow in regards to self-determination? That is, what does self-determination mean then? So what is a people? Possible answers that we've had at various points since World War II is that a people could be the residents of a colony. It, maybe it's an ethnic group. Maybe we should consider a people a religious minority, the citizens of a state. So these are various things that we've seen in state practice, in political discourse, um, and uh, essentially in, in a variety of rhetoric in regards to self-determination. Through various cases and incidences, including um, the breakup of Yugoslavia, the Holland Islands decision from back, you know, prior between in the interwar period between World War I and World War II, um, the issues having to do with um, that have come before the various human rights tribunals and so on. International lawyers have tried to focus in a little bit on how to define the idea of people and have been advising their foreign ministries in regards to this. In part, what we've done is a great sort of legal move, which is uh, sort of move away from the term and we think that we're going to clarify it, but we essentially decide to redefine people as being this. Um, so a sort of standard lawyerly move, which is it's a lot of writing, um, but it attempts to be a bit more precise. Let me summarize it. Um, instead of talking about people, many times you find international lawyers talking about self-determination units. That is, various units that have some type of right of self-determination. One way that you can sort of summarize it would be this. The first A is essentially former colonies. 
former colonies are viewed as having some type of right of self-determination. The B subpoint would be states. Um, this deals with the question of ethnicity. One of the concerns in the post-war period were if peoples are purely defined as ethnic groups, what does that say about multi-ethnic states? And one of the results was we should think of a state as a whole as being a people. So the United States, a multi-ethnic state, there's a people of the United States. It doesn't have to be a bunch of different peoples that, have to, that happen to be living here, but we can think of a people of the US. I'm going to skip over C for the moment, and I want to go to D, which is by mutual agreement. If there's some type of negotiation or conflict, if both sides agree that the two sides are self-determination units, you can have it by mutual agreement. The C subpoint here is the key definition because it relates to what we're talking about in the frozen conflicts. It states that other territories forming distinct political geographical areas whose inhabitants are arbitrarily excluded from any share in the government of either of their region or of the state to which they belong to the extent that in effect it is a non-self-governing territory, we should view that as a self-determination unit. Now, the query would then be in regards to Transnistria or South Ossetia or Abkhazia, if they fit that definition um, uh, in the relationship that they'd had with their, with their pre-existing states. Is that definition met by the population of Transnistria? My answer to this would be no. I don't have time to go into this right now in the, the couple of minutes I have left in this presentation, but we can talk about it during question and answer. If so, though, Let's say that it did meet the definition of a self-determination unit. What do they receive as a remedy? So that means they're a self-determination unit. They have a right to self-determination. What does that mean? In regards to the relation of self-determination and secession, international law is silent as to secession. That is, international law does not say that there is a right to secede. In fact, it pointedly doesn't say that there's a right to secede, except in issues of decolonization. But they view that the decolonization era essentially ended in the 1960s, by and large. But at the same time, secession is not illegal under international law, um, although it could be illegal under the domestic law of the state in which the secessionists are attempting, for, are attempting to leave. So secession is viewed in international law as a fact, not a right. That is, either there's been a, a successful secession or there hasn't been. There is no right to it, but it's, not all, it's also not prevented by international law. Now, this is actually an important point in regards to the rhetoric regarding self-determination. Because self-determination in the view of international lawyers has essentially split into two conflicts, internal self-determination and external self-determination. Internal self-determination is what self-determination units essentially have a right to. That is minority rights within the country in which they live. Think of it as essentially human rights. The ability also to educate your children in your own language to worship God or not worship anything as you would have it, as you would have it done, to essentially these group of, of individual and group rights. There's also external self-determination, which, which would be essentially a right of secession. But for examples of decolonization, the result that you get under self-determination is internal self-determination. So under this view, even if the Transnistrian population meets the self-determination unit criteria, they still do not have a right to secede. Internal self-determination is the remedy. The question of how to best ensure their rights, linguistic, cultural, and otherwise, within Moldova. If, as a matter of fact, they do secede, then it's up to other countries to, choose, to decide whether or not to recognize them as an independent entity. And that leads to what many have called the Kosovo question, which is the question of recognition. Now, I don't have a lot of time left, so in the few minutes I have left, I'm going to actually set aside some of the issues in regards to recognition, because I want to sort of move forward to a broader question having to do with the role of international law and, um, uh, and conflict resolution. Um, I'd note that, um, state that a couple of things in regards to recognition, very briefly, is that recognition has been largely viewed as being a legal, a, excuse me, a political decisions that states are able to undertake. But there are traditions in international law that sometimes recognition could be viewed as being an, an external intervention into an internal conflict of another state. That is, if there's a secessionist group and you choose to recognize that group as being an independent state and you start to um, give them certain rights and you start to treat them as a separate state, 
sometimes that can be viewed as an intervention into what is actually an internal conflict in another country in which they're trying to decide essentially what's happening in their constitutional system. So what happens to places like the TMR, which are largely unrecognized? As others have mentioned, they're viewed as de facto states. The term that we use in international law is usually de facto regimes because we don't want to confuse the idea of the rights of states that they have as a matter of statehood, but instead viewed as a de facto regime in which there's effective control over the territory, but it doesn't have the de jure, the legal ratification of controlling the territory. De facto regimes as a matter of international law are able to enter into international agreements for the safety of the population, but those agreements are viewed as being less protected than treaties. So the pre-existing state has essentially greater rights under international law than the de facto regime. So a few things about does law matter? And if so, how does law matter? Um, one of the ways that this has come up recently has been particularly the question of how the US can support Kosovar independence but be against South, South Ossetian. How Russia can support South Ossetian independence but be against Kosovo's. Um, are there principal distinctions? The US has basically said in regards to Kosovo that they don't want to talk about this as a legal issue primarily. They say Kosovo is unique, don't worry, it's not precedent. Um, now, that, might, you know, that has been something that's caused a certain amount of concern because precedent, you might have, make an issue in terms of whether or not it's legal precedent, but of course politically it's been something that's been viewed as a very important event that has affected the thinking in uh, separatist, secessionist, nationalist groups the world over. Um, I'll skip over the South Ossetia discussion for now, and I want to just close with a few observations in regards to uh, what I'm calling here, you know, as lawyers we talk about a lot about the rule of law. Um, here I actually want to talk about the rule of politics and the role of law. Um, there are four ways that I think international law uh, interacts with international politics in relation to the frozen conflicts. There's law as a framework of conflict resolution. That is to the extent that law is used as underlying guidelines in mediations having to do with the, uh, with the frozen conflicts. To a certain extent, um, uh, it hasn't been explicitly used, but as I'll talk about in a moment, it sets up some frameworks for thinking about the relationships of the parties. Um, there's the use of institutions as a mean of tactical advantage, which I'll set aside for the moment. Um, but I want to focus on two other issues. Law is a rhetorical tool in terms of your public diplomacy, and law is a potential source of conflict. So law, international law can be viewed as a, essentially a diplomatic vocabulary. It sets the terms of discourse. You can think about the terms that we don't use anymore, largely because they don't conform with our understandings of how states should act, and, and within that, specifically international law. You don't hear states talking much anymore about this is my justifiable sphere of influence. Everybody else stay out. They used to, but they don't do that quite as much anymore. You don't hear states talking very much about, I need a place in the sun, therefore I should be able to take this territory. Territorial integrity, self-determination, those are the terms that are used. Much of the debate in regards to the frozen conflicts are around the accepted terms that we have in treaties and legal discourse. It's not necessarily whether or not all of the rules are followed as legal rules, but it frames the discussion. Law can also be viewed not only as providing the vocabulary, but also the grammar, how the terms can fit together. For example, whether or not self-determination should be viewed as being something that is grammatically consistent with secession. Under most views of international law, it is not the same, although sometimes in political rhetoric they are made as equivalences, though they should not be. Similarly, you don't hear the terms of a right and aggression being used together. You don't hear states talk about my, my right to aggression. Um, so once again, the terms that sort of coexist or don't coexist is in part framed by how the international community has chosen to define its terms in international law. So it's not only the vocabulary, but it's also the grammar. To this, I would say that talk is not cheap. Um, usage is copied, so ways in which states talk about various terms are copied by other states, and that forms habits and norms get internalized. I mean, this type of argument is, you know, comes as no surprise in, in Colombia. You know, I'm basically making a constructivist argument here. Um, and that is in part, I think, one of the roles that's particularly important in terms of thinking about international law. So in closing, the three uses or abuses of international law. We can think about international law being discussed by three types of claimants. Aspirant states, without de facto regimes or de facto states, pre-existing states, and great powers. 
Aspirin states talk a lot about a people, that we're a people that we're somehow separate from the people, from the folks in the pre-existing states. We have group rights and we equate self-determination and secession. Pre-existing states talk more about the legal issues having to do with sovereignty and the rights of states, specifically in terms of territorial integrity. They focus in on different parts of international legal discourse. And great powers, and by this I would mean in the case of the frozen conflicts, the US, Russia, uh, the EU states, tend to talk more about systemic managerial interests in terms of peace, peace and security in the region and so on. But the final point on this is this. Sometimes the terms that we use set norms. And in setting norms, they set expectations. And they might actually end up constraining us in ways that we didn't see. So even though you might, we might try to sometimes use international legal rhetoric as a fig leaf to help us in what we're doing, the way that we set that rhetoric, the way that we set those expectations can, in fact, then constrain the states down the line. And it's essentially like a law of unintended consequences, which I think is actually probably the most important law in the international system. So with that, I look forward to your questions afterwards. And um, thank you very much. Thank you. It'll be interesting to see if the effect of a change in discourse or norms from the international community does have a real political effect on the regions and the peoples and the part of the world that we're all interested in here in this room. In other words, if, if there is a real shift from seeking self-determination or statehood to a, a greater concentration on internal sovereignty and group rights. Okay, now I'm happy to introduce Corey Welt, who is Associate Director and Professorial Lecturer of International Affairs at the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. He is the co-director of PONARS, which is the program on new approaches to research and security in Eurasia. And uh, PONARS is about to have its own 20 years since the collapse of the Soviet Union conference next week. And Corey is pulling that together quite nicely. And he is a specialist on the region, has written several articles and book chapters on conflict resolution, transborder security, and political change in the region. Corey? Great. Thank you very much, Elise, and thanks to Herman and Lincoln and Alex for putting together this terrific conference. Uh, uh, first, I, should, I would just say that I thought that your presentation should be uh, the required prologue in front of the Tagliavini report and in front of the ruling on Kosovo. I thought that was extraordinarily educational and very interesting. Uh, I'm going to focus more on, on, on facts as opposed to rights, um, not at all to privilege facts over rights, but I think it's a useful way to structure the discussion on the role of external actors. And what I want to do is, is try to help set up the discussion uh, of the next panel, which frankly I think is the most valuable portion of, the, of, of today's uh, proceedings on what we do moving forward. So I want to focus on the role of external actors in conflict resolution looking forward, the potentially constructive role of external actors in conflict resolution. And by conflict resolution, uh, I'll uh, go ahead and, and show my cards and suggest that what I mean to say about conflict resolution is anything that excludes for the time being full secession, full uh, either annexation or full independence of the de facto states, the de facto regimes, Anything short of that, creative forms of sovereignty, some kind of reintegration on a loose confederal structure or autonomy, that's what I think of when I'm talking about conflict resolution and the role of actors. So what I want to do is first focus, spend most of my time talking about Russia, the actor that we've talked about already in some detail in the first panel, and pose what I consider to be three meaningful questions about Russia's role in conflict resolution and counterpose that to two less meaningful questions. Uh, then I will talk about the role of the United States and simply highlight what I see as a lack of, of a strategic coherent approach on conflict resolution in the region, probably something that's unsurprising, but I want to dig into that a little bit more. Talk very briefly about uh, what we might call somewhat uh, uh, in an in unpolitically correct way the great white hope of the region, the European Union and Turkey uh, in terms of actors that might, uh, 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 their involvement might lead to uh, uh, desirable outcomes. And then if I have a moment, just step into this discussion of, 
of, uh, of what to do and, and, and how to think of governance in the de facto regimes. So first on, on Russia, three meaningful questions. Which, which are the not so meaningful questions for conflict resolution? I think there are two which I, I spend time thinking about. I think they're incredibly important. I think they're less important in this venue. Uh, one is whether or not Russia or Russians or Moscow or the Soviet Union were, was responsible for the outbreak of the conflicts in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Um, and whether Russia or Russians were responsible for the outcome of those conflicts. I think that's an extraordinarily complex question, and I'm not quite sure that the answer to the question is that pertinent to how we think about uh, the conflicts moving forward. The second not so meaningful question, but an important one, is whether Russia or Russians are capable of single-handedly eliminating the conflicts between the actors. Oftentimes, we've heard in the past and we've discussed in many sessions whether or not Russia could just snap its fingers and suddenly the Alpaz and the Georgians would love each other, Ossetians, Armenians, and Azeris, and so on and so forth. I think we well understand now that there are real interests, real differences, uh, real conflicts, real passions and emotions, uh, and, and that the de facto regimes and the populations are real actors uh, uh, among themselves and the conflicts would not just disappear if Russia were to snap its fingers. But I, I think that's a different question than my first meaningful question. And, I think, and what I want to do is try to, try, try to think more concretely about the role of Russia moving forward. So I pose these three questions. The first question is whether, uh, whether Russian support for the status quo is the key factor in preventing a peaceful form of conflict resolution. Not that Russia could uh, suddenly, as I said, erase the conflicts or erase the differences, but could Russia single-handedly, either by threatening to withdraw the kind of political, economic, uh, and, and military support that it has, um, or by offering a new set of carrots to Abkhaz, South Ossetians, Karabakhis, and Transnistrians, could it somehow encourage, compel, the break, I call them, by the way, not de facto states or de facto regimes, breakaway autonomies. That's my, that's my category. Could it compel the breakaway autonomies to reunite uh, with their host states or agree to some form of creative uh, a sovereignty that they might not otherwise accept? If the Russians were to say to the regions, the game is up, what would happen? I think that's the first question. I'm not going to offer you very, I'm not going to offer you concrete answers to these questions right now, but we can raise them in discussion, uh, except to say the answer seems to be a little bit more problematic with the case of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, than with the other three. The second meaningful question is, uh, even if we assume that the Russians could affect a resolution to the conflicts, the big, the larger geopolitical structural question is, is whether Russia, under what conditions would they do so? And, and the way I try to pose this question is not to talk about, not to start directly with Russian interest, but to ask about deals and ask about trade-offs and ask whether or not Russians could imagine an acceptable deal with metropolitan states that would lead it to withdraw support for the current status quo, that would lead it uh, towards some kind of resolution. And then we get into questions of what it is that the Russians want. And there, I mean, is it about consent to the Eurasian Union that Dennis raised? Is it about, uh, in, it about having Azerbaijan or Moldova join the Collective Security Treaty Organization or Economic Union? Is it about ensuring 49-year bases in these countries? Uh, would that be sufficient for Russia to change its approach to the conflict zones? Um, is, it, is it about neutrality? I mean, this is something that wasn't taken so seriously uh, in earlier years, and it's something that's come up more frequently. Uh, if Georgia declared that it was going to be neutral, that it forswore all hope of ever entering NATO, would that be the trade-off that Russia would be looking for in order to uh, effect some kind of resolution to the conflicts? Uh, is it about the structure of the conflict, uh, of the resolution to the conflict? Are there certain forms of resolutions that Russia would believe to be in its interests? The famous COSAC plan that was proposed for Transnistria several years ago in which uh, Transnistria was united to Moldova on a confederal model, and Russia played a very significant role as an arbiter of, uh, of the two sides and as a guarantor of the arrangement. Uh, is that sufficient? Is it a matter of details? Uh, if it's not about any of these things, then, then what is it about? Are there concessions that could be given trade-offs uh, that would enable Russia to think more uh, in, think more about itself as an active player in the resolution of conflicts? Um, is it about things that the United States is supposed to do or provide? Uh, when you start to think in this way, though, you, you do get into the, the, the 
the sort of overwhelming commitment problem that's involved is whether, are there things that we or the states, Georgia, Moldova, Azerbaijan, could do to guarantee Russia's interest? Is it enough to have a signature on a piece of paper? Is it enough to agree to certain institutions? Or is there going to be a looming fear uh, that Russia faces, that, that Russia deals with if it agrees to uh, some kind of a resolution of conflicts. If we say, yes, we take NATO membership, NATO expansion off the table now, what guarantee is there to Russia that that would be off the table in 10 years' time under conditions in which Georgia is reunited, uh, somehow not going to Karabakh flows peacefully with, with Azerbaijan? Um, and then, of course, and, and it's clear, is 2008 has made this issue a much more problematic one recognition takes on a life of its own. We can't expect Russia to, to withdraw recognition of independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. It might, over a period of several decades, it might, like Turkey, make it provisional to a conflict resolution process. If the Abkhaz and South Ossetians were to agree one day, then uh, that would be their choice and we would withdraw recognition. Uh, so, so policy itself takes on a life of its own, and not only formal recognition, but we also have to acknowledge the fact that Russia has had this policy of support for the last 20 years, and it may not be so easy politically to just turn on a dime. Many think that Russia could change its policy. Sergei mentioned uh, the important role of the North Caucasus. I think that is a consideration of Russia's, uh, in Russia's thinking about conflict resolution, but I'd also just push back on to Sergei on that and suggest that yes, there's an interest in stability, there's an interest in not inflaming the ingush ossetian conflict or other potential conflicts in, in the North Caucasus, but that doesn't necessarily lead to a single uh, a policy recommendation. There's a variety of options that the Russians might consider in order to deal with problems like the North Caucasus. Um, Third important question is even if we could imagine, even if the Russians could bring the de facto, the breakaway autonomies to the table, even if they could imagine certain deals in which their interests are satisfied and in exchange they support conflict resolution, the question still holds on the other side. Are Georgians, Azeris, and Moldovans willing to uh, accept the terms of the deals that Russia might propose if the terms of the deal are long-term military bases, CSTO membership, uh, loose confederal structures. Are these the kinds of things that uh, populations in the metropolitan states would approve of? And it gets messy, and I think we actually need to see a lot more of the excellent survey research that Gerard has done on what populations of these states uh, imagine in terms of the future uh, structures of, uh, uh, of, of, of the region. Um, but there's also, as I indicated, there's a problem, there's a commitment problem that the Russians have with regard to looking outward and worrying about uh, what other actors like the United States and NATO might be doing in the future. There's, of course, a great commitment problem that the Georgians, Azeris, and Moldovans would face. Uh, Georgians articulate this time and time again that, that even if Russia were to uh, propose a uh, one uh, uh, 25-year military base in Abkhazia as a condition for some kind of uh, reunification. The supposition is that Russia will always want more. What's the guarantee that Russia won't agree to one thing now and then push for something else later? It's not something that the metropolitan states uh, might be w might be willing to accede to. So, uh, it's again I said I'm not going to necessarily give you answers, but I think it's important to think about these questions systematically, uh, and I do think they're more important uh, than the questions as to whether Russia was originally responsible and whether the, the differences, the conflicts would simply disappear uh, if Russia uh, snapped its fingers. Uh, now on the United States. The, again, it's not a surprise the United States doesn't have a coherent strategy. The one slide said it all. Kosovo not being a precedent was an unfortunate and, and I mean, it was, it, it, it was, it makes sense from the perspective of U.S. policy. It was not a precedent for the U.S. to recognize anyone else just because they were recognizing Kosovo, but clearly it was a precedent in the way it impacted the thinking uh, among Russians and among others in, in, in the breakaway uh, regions. Uh, but it also was a precedent in terms of the ease of unilateral recognition. I think the message that Russia really got from Kosovo was, well, the United States can do whatever it wants, then, we, then what's holding us back from, from recognizing whoever we want and whenever? Uh, so, so there's no surprise, but even outside of Kosovo, if you look at NK, the two conflict, the abkhaz south Ossetian conflicts in Transnistria, you really find that the United States doesn't have a, a coherent strategy, and it uh, appears as if the, the uh, our entry into the conflict resolution processes in these four cases has happened by happenstance. It's happened by a random set of circumstances 
uh, which have very little to do with the dynamics of the conflict itself. It's not, we don't have different approaches because the conflicts themselves are unique. We have different approaches because of other circumstances. What do I mean? Uh, do we work with Russia constructively on resolving conflicts in the post-Soviet space? On Nagorno-Karabakh? Of course we do, right? We, and, the, and the Americans go out of their way to, uh, uh, to underline what a constructive actor we perceive Russia to be in the resolution of the Karabakh conflict. Now, many will question whether or not Russia is a constructive actor or not, but the U.S. government has no problem with that. On Moldova, uh, not as close, but pretty close. We've had quite an experience of working with the Russians and a willingness to work with the Russians in seeking a solution to the Transnistrian conflict. On Abkhazia and South Ossetia, no way. Right? Russia is perceived as the adversary. Russia is perceived as the problem. Russia is perceived as an actor to a greater degree than it is in the other conflicts. Uh, the question of territorial integrity. In terms of words, what's on paper, we respect territorial integrity in all of these cases. But in practice, uh, it's very clear that we support territorial integrity of Georgia. Uh, it, it's, it's a mantra, and Lincoln might speak about this as well, um, and it sometimes forecloses the possibility of thinking a little bit more creatively, cre creatively about uh, what we're seeking in terms of resolution. Uh, in Moldova, territorial integrity? Well, yes, but it's a different kind of territorial integrity. We're pretty comfortable with a very loose Cyprus model, confederal model for Transnistria in a way that we're not even thinking about for Abkhazia or South Ossetia. You talk about confederalism now, for Abkhazia and South Ossetia, uh, you talk about even the willingness to recognize uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia as autonomies in the American approach, they shrink away from, from anything other than Abkhazia and South Ossetia as parts of Georgia. On Azerbaijan, on Nagorno-Karabakh, territorial integrity, the whole thrust of the means process is about how to get Azerbaijan to let Nagorno-Karabakh go. That's, not, that's more frank than they would put it, but that's the angle. Why? Why is it that we're more comfortable with the notion of self-determination for Nagorno-Karabakh than we are for the others? Uh, I already mentioned, you know, do we have developed notions of local self-government? Not at all in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, uh, to some degree in Transnistria, and in NK, we've got this idea, interim status, which everybody gets very excited about, but nobody's really uh, fleshed out the details of what that means. Russian military is part of a solution. In Moldova, I think there's been some acceptance, understanding that a Russian military presence of sort might be uh, important. Again, thanks to Gerard's survey data, maybe the Transnistrians don't want it, uh, which makes it a bit easier. Uh, anywhere else? No. Off the table in considerations of the future of Georgia, causing South Ossetia, off the table uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, I wanted to say something about the CFB treaty, but I'm going to skip that. The Moving to the third point, the, the two great hopes, Europe and, and Turkey. Uh, on Europe, I, I know Sabine is probably going to spend more time addressing this, and others can as well, but it, 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 is, it has been the great hope. There's been a sense that Europe can succeed where the United States can't. Its relationship with Russia is less uh, loaded, is less problematic. Uh, it doesn't come with the specter of NATO enlargement, even though even though, um, and, uh, and there's also a sense that from the outside, I think, that the Europeans pay a little bit more attention to detail. They pay a little bit more attention, not just to diplomacy, but to actual processes of conflict transformation, which are longer term and get into some of the nitty gritty uh, that the United States is unwilling to do for some reason in these conflicts. We've been doing it in Cyprus and some other places, but for some reason, we, we, we don't focus, we, we let the Europeans get their hands dirty. And there have been some small but significant inroads. The, assist, the border missions along the Transnistria line, uh, the EU monitoring mission after 2008, even Sarkozy's role in brokering peace after brokering the end of the war as, as, uh, it, it is something that I think was, was significant and important. Uh, the great work of Peter Semnaby for many years as special representative, the, kind, the idea of having somebody who can uh, freely speak to all actors and all sides is something that I think was incredibly important. Um, the recent WTO deal between the Russians and the Georgians, not brokered by the EU, but brokered by the Swiss. I'll be very anxious to hear uh, my colleague Ambassador Yakubashvili thinks about the WTO deal, but this is a deal that uh, has a lot of potential impact on Russia-Georgia relations and the conflict zones, not, so, not uh, as much as it does on the WTO itself. So I think if Europe can get through its current issues, there's a lot more that we can hope for from Europe. Uh, Turkey, just one sentence. 
Uh, more focus has been put not on the role of Russia in resolving the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, but on the role of Turkey. And not necessarily Turkey as an active uh, a, a broker of peace, but the linkage between the Turkish-Armenian process, opening the borders, normalizing relations, and the resolution of the Karabakh conflict. And the Turkish-Armenian process has uh, 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 crashed, and it's uh, becoming, it has less, far less ambitions than it had a few years ago, but the principled question of the nature of the linkage between the two processes remain, and I'd simply say that for those who seek to push for Turkish-Armenian rapprochement and to do so before a resolution of the Karabakh conflict, we've got to do a lot more work at really explaining and really convincing Azeris why Turkish-Armenian rapprochement would be in Azerbaijani interest and why it would lead to a resolution of a conflict that takes their interest into consideration. And it's a tough thing to do, but it's not good enough simply to say, if the border is opened, Karabakh conflict will be resolved. That's, that's not compelling. So finally, in conclusion, what, what is to be done? Um, I, I agree with Sergei's response to a, a question about open borders. I, I think we should be, we're not, whatever Russia's change in behavior is going to be, it's going to be over a, a long period of time. In the meantime, I think that we do need to work consistently and persistently on normalizing the situation around the breakaway uh, autonomies, the breakaway regions, encouraging transparency of borders, encouraging normalization of relations. It is difficult, but the more time passes, the more Russia and Georgia even are able to come up with agreements that implicitly uh, prepare the ground for, for, for transparency and movement, uh, uh, the, the, the better will be. And, and finally, I would say to get to the subject of the first panel and this question of terms, yes, it is extraordinarily difficult still uh, for particularly Georgia and Azerbaijan to engage with the de facto regimes or the de facto states. The, the Moldovans, not so much. They have a bit of an easier time about it. And, and, and we have a difficult time. And my suggestion is we, we need to find a middle ground and not think of them as states. Russia's recognized the independence of two of them. Okay, let it be. Um, uh, we won't, we don't, we, and we will fight to have others not recognize. But it's not enough simply to think about them as regions or as whole parts of the metropolitan state. My solution, given the size of these regions, given the relationship of these regions to their current patrons, uh, is to, to think about them conceptually as local governments. And they're local governments that you can engage with on a state to local government basis. Local governments in the sense that they not, might not be democratically elected by all of the formal residents of that region, but they're not really apartheid regions because we don't really think of local governments as apartheid governments. Uh, they're governments that preside over regions in which either they have kicked out populations or populations have fled. In either case, they still govern the territory uh, over which they preside. And I think that conceiving of them as local governments at least might help break down some uh, philosophical barriers to engagement. And I'll conclude with that. Thank you. Thank you, Corey, for helping us uh, systematically think through some of the <clears throat> um, issues raised broadly in Chris's presentation. That is the effect of recognition by the US and Russia on these breakaway autonomies, as well as the possible various motivations and interests of each act or each state especially Russia with regard to the resolution of each of the conflicts. Okay, now we turn to a presentation by Columbia and Harriman's own Lincoln Mitchell, um, who has... <coughs> oh, okay. We're gonna go in order that we are sitting in. Uh, so now we're gonna turn to a presentation by Svante Cornell, uh, who is the research director of the Central Asia Caucasus Institute and Silk Road Studies Program at SICE at, George, uh, at Johns Hopkins University in Washington, D.C. And he's also a co-founder of the Institute for Security and Development Policy in Stockholm. Um, you will know him from his publications, uh, from his many publications, um, as well as uh, from his work as the editor of the Central Asia Caucasus Analyst um, and of four books as well. So without further ado, I'm happy to introduce Svante Cornell. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to speak here. Uh, I thought um, to uh, put somewhat focus on the, one of the words in the headline of this panel, which is the word competition. 
and to discuss whether there is, in fact, uh, a form of external competition regarding the conflicts that we're talking about and these entities. And my uh, primary conclusion is that I don't think we, we have. Or if we do, there's really one major competitor. And I'll get into that. But first, I'd like to say a few words about what are these conflicts and what are these entities uh, that we're talking about. Um, I'd like to restate what Sergei Markadonov said this morning, which is that frozen is probably uh, the wrong word to use for these conflicts because it gives you my usual kind of analogy to a froze. If a conflict is frozen, it's like having a frozen piece of meat in your freezer. If you don't eat it tonight, nothing's going to change, right? You can eat it in a month or even in a year. Uh, it gives you the idea that there is nothing that's going to happen to this piece of meat or piece of conflict if you leave it alone. It suggests, as Sergei said, a lack of dynamism. And in fact, what you find across all of these conflicts is uh, substantial amounts of dynamism. I think the, um, the case of Armenia-Azerbaijan is the most obvious example where you have a dramatic shift in power between the two countries involved uh, in the favor of the country that lost the war. Uh, and is not sitting on the land, but is having to ho house a, a huge number of refugees. Um, is this sustainable? Is it frozen? Certainly not. We can discuss whether it's sustainable or not. Um, I agree with Corey about the fact that it's, uh, you know, discussing who was to blame for these conflicts is probably not the most productive. However, I think it's important to, to note that over the past 20 years, the nature of the conflicts have evolved. They all started in one way or another as primarily intercommunal conflicts uh, in which you could discuss to what extent there was a level of manipulation by the central powers in Moscow and later on by the Russian government. But I think the, my argument would be that over time, uh, these conflicts have been overtaken by geopolitics in a way. Um, and you can see that especially, of course, in the fact that all the, uh, the level of Russian interference in uh, the uh, governing entities of the de facto regimes, to use, uh, to use your term, uh, would be, uh, have been increasing quite s s significantly over the past 20 years. This is, Nagorno-Karabakh is a little different, but even, even there you see the very tight interlinkage between the Armenian uh, governant, governing institutions and the Karabakh governing institutions. In the case of the other three, Transnistria, South Ossetia, and, and Abkhazia, to various degrees you see uh, Russian government institutions basically taking over uh, these entities and doing so far, especially in South Ossetia and Transnistria, to appoint serving uh, members of the Russian security services into high position in the de facto regimes, uh, governing institutions, which questions in my mind to what extent you can, you, you can view these as local governments, as Corey would have uh, put it, or even as independent entities that you, know, uh, that you could deal with uh, you could deal with them, but when you deal with them, do you deal with an independent entity or you deal with something very different? That's, a, that's an important question. Now again, um, when we talk about competition, I think there is, it's important to look over time at who are the competitors. And I think there is an argument to be made that the, uh, the, the overtaking of these conflicts by geopolitics that I referred to was uh, in great part a result of the growing uh, geopolitical interest in the region, and particularly in the Caucasus. You see less of this in, uh, in Moldova, uh, less acutely at least, but you, you see it. But in the Caucasus especially, you have a growth of, uh, uh, of um, if you will, the stakes involved in conflict management and conflict resolution, or really in anything relating to these territories, uh, because of numerous issues. For example, in the 1990s, the beginning of Western engagement and involvement in the region. At that time, Western would have included Turkey. Today, it probably doesn't. Uh, Turkey doesn't behave in coordination with the West in, in this region as it used to. Uh, you had, of course, Iranian involvement as well. There was a lot of flux. In the 2000s, I think the big issue was NATO enlargement uh, that, was, uh, that was beginning to, um, uh, to form the kind of core narrative for this geopolitical competition. But in terms of um, all of this, I think it's important to observe that uh, the Russian government's manipulation of these conflicts for its own narrow political purposes did not come as a result of growing Western, Turkish, or NATO involvement in the region. It predated this Western engagement and involvement in the region. You see it directly in the heavy involvement of the Russian military in the Abkhazia conflict. Of course, as, as, as was mentioned earlier, the fact that the 
the, the uh, ceasefire agreement between, was between Moldova and Russia, acknowledging a Russian role de facto as a belligerent party to this conflict in, nine, in long before there was any form of Western serious engagement with Moldova, and similarly, of course, um, uh, well, acro across the entire territory. NATO enlargement, likewise, uh, was it really NATO that sought to expand into the Ukraine or the Caucasus, or was it the states involved, uh, Ukraine and Georgia, uh, that for reasons uh, of their own, uh, felt that the security protection of NATO was something that was so valuable, so critical to them, that they tried to drag NATO into the region. And I would certainly, my argument would be that it was the latter of these two, of these two options. So NATO, in a way, became engaged as a more or less reluctant, uh, reluctant um, uh, competitor in this region. Of course, depending on which NATO members you're talking about, some were more eager and some were more reluctant, and we can discuss that. Uh, if you move over to the present uh, period, however, in the past, let us say, two to three years, I think there's been a remarkable change in terms of how this so-called competition has evolved in terms of, I think, the, uh, the decline of competition, geopolitical competition in this region. And I would make the argument that there is only one power at this point that is seriously involved in, in competition, namely Russia, uh, and has been continuing to seek to manipulate uh, the uh, unresolved conflicts for its own purposes. And I th I'll give you a few examples of what I think has been happening over the past few years. Um, the, um, the, the broader context, of course, is of Western powers that are in a state of internal crisis, uh, as well as pursuing various forms of reset with Russia, the Obama administrations being the most um, prominent. Uh, the Poles have their own reset. Many other European countries have been engaging in their reset with Russia, all of which has meant, has translated into a lesser degree of engagement with uh, both practical and rhetorical and involvement with the uh, security-related issues in the former Soviet Union. Um, but there are, if you look at some of the things that have been happening over the past few years, you see some interesting patterns. I'll, I'll actually, and Georgia is perhaps the one where least has happened, because after we're living in, a, in the environment of the, of the post-2008 war, in which I think the major things that are happening on the ground, I, I would say on the one hand, is the Russian attempts to enforce an arms embargo on Georgia, quite successfully. The U.S. government continues to refuse to sell more, most kinds or almost any kind of weaponry to, to Georgia, uh, as do many other countries. Uh, there is an attempt to, of diplomatic isolation of Georgia, which has been less successful. Uh, there is this constant covert operations, uh, funding of radical opposition, sabotage, including bombs at the U.S. Embassy compound in Tbilisi and so on that have been tracked back to the Russian uh, uh, special services. Uh, more than that, I think there is, a, they, there is a Russian attempt on a diplomatic level to argue that Russia is not a party to this conflict. This is really between uh, Georgia and Abkhazia and South Ossetia. That was always Russia's line. Uh, the difference, and if you will, the only perhaps silver lining of, of this war is that whereas the West, uh, everybody knew uh, at a higher political level, not to speak of an analytical level, that Russia was a party to these conflicts, in the official discourse, the UN Security Council resolutions kept praising the role of the, of the Russian peacekeepers in Abkhazia and so on for their fantastic work in, in keeping the peace, whereas everybody knew that these were, well, they, they were exactly keeping the pieces rather than keeping the peace, so to speak. That's not my term. I've borrowed that from somebody else. Um, but today, everybody recognizes officially that Russia is a party to the conflict and Russia's attempts to extricate itself from that and to again make it appear as a local conflict that they're not an, a party to has been failing. I think what's been happening in Moldova and, and in, between Armenia and Azerbaijan is more interesting in a sense, because uh, especially Moldova, because what you've seen in Moldova the, over the past few years is a very a bold effort by the German government to engage Russia in a serious attempt of conflict resolution in Moldova in something that's been called the Meisberg Initiative or process after the German castle in which a summit meeting was held in which these issues were discussed. And the, uh, the fact is that the Germans have essentially to told the Russians, if you want to be part of European security and in integrated in European security institutions and mechanisms, let's have Moldova as a test case. Let's try to see if we can work together on resolving this conflict. And uh, I don't have time to go into the details, but 
it's clear uh, that the, the Germans have gone out of their way to meet the Russian position on Moldova and on Transnistria more than halfway, going very far in terms of accepting Russian language about how the Moldovan constitution would look, the neutrality of Moldova, uh, the language of how the parties are referred to, many of these things we could discuss that. Uh, and if, in spite of this, in spite of the, the, ver the larger ramifications of what Russia could get for a cooperative stance in Moldova and on Transnistria, the result has been practically nothing unless something has happened the two days since the talks restarted that I'm not aware of. The Russians have essentially given the signal that no, we are happier to keep this controlled instability in Moldova rather than contribute to a res resolution of the conflict that would give us a larger uh, influence over European security. And that, I think, is very telling. The second thing uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, of course, over the past several years is that more or less, you know, essentially, after having invaded Georgia two months later, just at the time that the U.S. is involved in its electoral campaign, or the final, might actually after the election itself, the Russian government says, hey, we now want to make peace between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And the big surprise to me is why the Western powers said, yeah, sure, you know, why not? Uh, to me, the credibility of Russia as a mediator between two Caucasian countries after having invaded the third and occupied parts of a territory and building up large military bases there is preposterous. And to me, therefore, there, it's not a surprise that this Russian-led mediation effort in which the French and the U.S. co-chairs basically took a second role, a backseat to the Russian leadership, would fail. Because at least one of the parties, Azerbaijan, has, saw no credibility whatsoever in the Russian mediation effort, went to the talks because they had to, uh, but, not, but were acutely aware of the fact that this was a Russian proposal that would bring a Russian-dominated peace agreement uh, if they would sign it, in which uh, they felt that their independence and their sovereignty would be compromised. Um, and I think these are the, uh, these are the two the major efforts uh, or developments that have happened in the conflict resolution processes, which suggest, on the one hand, as I said, that there is one major competitor, if you will, in this external competition, and that continues to be Russia. And the West has essentially uh, disengaged from both the region itself in security terms and from the conflict resolution processes. Now, what's the sum of this, if you will? I would argue that the sum is that if Russia, after the uh, Georgia war, officially stated its, uh, its, uh, its uh, demand for a privileged zone of, in or a zone of privileged interest in the former Soviet Union, and not only, to quote Medvedev's words exactly, um, the West has rhetorically opposed any kind of Russian right to the sphere of influence, but has essentially led Moscow, led Moscow to believe that it has conceded this sphere of influence. Now, if that is the case, what has Russia to show for it at this point? Extremely little. It has extended its military bases in Ukraine and in, um, in Armenia. Uh, it has failed to, in spite of its effort, make any kind of dent in Georgia's continued survival and pro-Western uh, orientation. We could speak about what it's been, uh, failed to do in Central Asia. It's mainly alienated most uh, Central Asian governments further than before, as they have in Belarus. They have failed to uh, uh, provide a force of attraction that have uh, changed the, the essentially Euro-Atlantic uh, orientation of Moldova. Uh, and that is at a time when the West has basically prevented, or be, uh, the West has done very little to thwart Moscow's attempts to a sphere of influence. This suggests, of course, the lack of attraction that the Russian uh, membership in a Russian sphere of influence poses for the local countries. So the implications, and let me conclude on this note of this, is that um, there is no, pro there is, in my mind, not a problem of external competition, or actually, maybe there is. And the problem is that there is a serious lack of Western engagement, both in, the, in broader terms in the security affairs of this region, and especially in the conflict resolution processes. At the end of the day, it is on the Russian side primarily that this is viewed in a zero-sum uh, perspective, that a Western involvement is automatically something that is against Russian interests. I, th I think that the uh, Western governments have long, in, in, in many occasions, believed in their own uh, stated policies that there is no n necessary zero-sum relationship between uh, Western presence in the conflict resolution processes and the Russian legitimate interests in the region. 
so I think the, uh, the fact is that we, uh, if these conflicts are ever going to move to closer towards a resolution, there is a need of a more serious Western engagement in these processes, which is, I agree with Corey, not to be found at this time. Thank you for those insights into the effects of recent US and Russian and European uh, policies in the region. And now continuing the discussion, we will have Lincoln Mitchell, who is our resident Georgia US foreign policy expert here at Harriman Institute and the author of a recent book on the color Re revolutions as well as his book on <coughs> uncertain democracy, US foreign policy and Georgia's Rose Revolution, based uh, in large part on his work for the National Democratic Institute in Georgia. Lincoln? Thank you. I, I just want to begin by thanking, again, everyone who helped make this happen, as well as all our speakers and, and attendees for coming. Also, I just want to go be on record as saying, Alex and I weren't exactly comfortable with the phrase frozen conflict either. Um, <laughs> we really do hear this, but we just wanted to come up with something that would capture all the conflicts and the people would recognize. So, so please, I think when you say that, I, 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 we're all on the same page. Um, I was, the decision to put me on this panel came yesterday when I was really focused on some of the more less interesting and kind of administrative aspects of this conference. So I do not have any new research, nor do I have a, a, a deeply prepared text. So you might, to use a Georgian word, this might just qualify as kibitzing, but I offer it nonetheless. Um, I'm going to explore several themes and, and, and perhaps even paradoxes that frame uh, the issue of the role of outside actors in, in, in the conflicts. And I'm really going to look at Russia, Europe, and the US. And I'm going to focus more, but not entirely, on, on the Georgia-related conflicts. Also, I will try to keep my remarks a little on the brief side so that we have time for, for enough time for a, a discussion afterwards. Um, one of the points I want to raise, and Svante touched on this quite a bit at the end of his talk, so it's, I'm not going to dwell on it too much, is that there is this uh, phenomenon that outside players in the region, outside actors, try to present themselves as honest brokers, but, but they're not, right? I mean, the obvious example, I think, is the Russian peacekeepers uh, in, in, in Abkhazia, but, and, and, and the role, both, you know, the, both the Russian and Western role in, in, in the Minsk process and trying to resolve Nagorno-Karabakh. I mean, these are, all of these countries have a horse in all of these races, to, to badly paraphrase uh, Jim Baker. Uh, you know, Russia has a side, the United States has a side, the United States uh, in, in, in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, the Russia obviously has a side, the United States has interest there, we have relationships with those two countries of differing value and we need to, to kind of juggle that. In the uh, Abkhazian South Ossetia conflicts or, or efforts to resolve that or, or to bring some kind of uh, mo movement to it, the U.S. Is very clearly has a side, the U.S. is not, is, is interested in pursuing that side's interest um, and, 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 and not, for, for not for no reason, I mean for legitimate reasons. There's a strategic need uh, the U.S. perceives to, to contain Russia in, in the region, strategic need to support Georgia's notion of territorial integrity. These are not crazy ideas by the U.S., nor if you put yourself in Moscow's shoes, are they necessarily crazy ideas in Moscow, but they do frame the, the, the role of the external actors and they do make it very hard for anyone to really legitimately pose as an honest broker. I would also add that this is not unusual. We see this in other parts of, of, of the world as well. You go a few hundred miles south to the Middle East, and the U.S., I mean, uh, we, we'll say we're going to try to be an honest broker, um, which is not a role that it, that, that it, it really can or, or perhaps even should play. Um, a, a perhaps related point is that outside actors are still expected to do a lot. There is still a sense that the solution to these conflict can only these conflicts or, 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 to, or to unfreeze them, whatever the, the, the food-related metaphor you want to use is, can only come with outside assistance. Um, unfortunately, it appears that, that the ability of outside actors to do a lot is it, there's, not, there's not a lot of ability to do a lot. And that ability isn't getting more. In fact, it's getting less. Um, there's still a tendency to look for outside solutions. There's still both by the, by the participants inside uh, particularly. Um, the outside ac out actors have not accomplished much and, and the reason is that these conflicts are vexingly difficult. If these were easy to solve, they would have been solved 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago. If there was something that, that, that if there were fingers that anyone could snap or deals that anyone could cut, those deals would have been cut. But they haven't been and they haven't been for a range of complicated reasons. It's very hard 
to resolve a territorial integrity issue in Georgia with the role that Russia plays, with the views of the people currently living in Abkhazia. Those are issues that they're not just going to go away by uh, sustained Western presence. Sustained Western presence may help them go away, but they're not going to go away easily because of that. The Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is a very complicated issue. Uh, more resources going in from, well, from, from all these outside players with interests is not going to solve that conflict. It may help, but it's not going to be enough. And over time, I think the ability gets, gets smaller. And as states in the region get stronger, the ability to get stronger. Um, the next point I want to touch on is that there is also, whereas I, I think this question of whether or not there's competition that Svante raised is a question that, that's worth exploring more. Unfortunately, I'm not going to explore it here, but I think it's a good question. And, and, and whereas, um, and, and whether it's, it's you know, one actor kind of dominating most of that competition space is also something worth exploring. Um, one thing that does strike me is the way, there may not be that, a, a full competition. There is a form of competitive clientelism that is evolving in the region. And, and this is, in some respects, this works for the clients. It works for Abkhazia. Uh, it, it worked for South Ossetia until a week ago. Um, to be able to shake down Moscow for more money when they need it, to have a patron who can, the, the notion of Abkhaz statehood, which is something that uh, most countries in the world don't take seriously and, and it's not the notion I support, but it is, it, is, it is even harder to even think how anyone in Sahumi could possibly think of this without heavy Russian financial support. So they benefit from that relationship, just as an example. Similarly, Georgia benefits from it, its relationship uh, to the United States. I'm not saying the two are, are, are equal. I want to be clear on that. But I'm saying there's a similar dynamic in place, a powerful outside patron providing ample foreign assistance. In the case of Abkhazia, it's considerably more ample. I, I want to, again, be clear on that. But Georgia benefits from its relationship with the United States, right? The, uh, the, 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 the foreign assistance, while, while it's clear that Georgia would like uh, the United States to, to, again, sell weapons to them, and, and it hasn't happened yet, although I wouldn't be surprised if it did in the next few years, um, it, Georgia clearly benefits from its relationship with the United States and its relationship with, with Europe. But let's just talk about the United States now. The extent to which that works for the United States and Russia is different, right? The, the relationship with the United States, between the United States and Georgia, and, 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 and now, coming back to what we've seen the last week with Russia and Abkhazia and South Ossetia, often puts Russia and the United States in a bad position. It almost got the two of them in a shooting war, something we managed to avoid for almost half a century or so of Cold War, right? Um, it is, it is when, when you have clients, you are responsible for them. And this is, and this is something that affects both Moscow and Washington. So that's, that, that may not be direct competition, but it somehow has to do with the competition. Um, they're dragged into expensive relationships, expensive support. They can't always get what they want. They can't tell the leaders or the people of these, of these, in the case of Georgia country, in the case of other two places, what to do. They may know what they want, but they can't get that from them. And, and again, the, the, the recent events in South Ossetia are, are, are a big headache for Russia and, and, and speak to some of the, the, the problems of this. Um, while, while there are outside actors, I think that one of the reasons that the competition may, perceive, may be perceived as, as one-sided is that one side has, it's very clear what the interest of one side of the competition is. So Russia's interests are clear. And, and again, speaking largely about Abkhazia and South Ossetia. The first is to weaken Georgia. I, I, I don't know that I agree with everything Svante said in that vein, but, uh, but I think the gist of it is, is clear. Russia doesn't want a strong, powerful Georgia on its southern border. It wants to weaken ties in general between the region and the West, not just Georgia, but, but, but Georgia in particular. It wants to limit NATO expansion. Russia wants to limit NATO expansion. We, we, we know all of this. And again, those, are, those may not be things with which we in this room agree. They may not be things which we think are, are wise for Moscow, but they are, are either explicitly stated or so strongly implied that it's hard to miss that that is, that is Moscow's uh, agenda regarding these conflicts. Um, the U.S. and Russia, and U.S. and Europe, I think, is, is far less clear. We can speak in some very broad br brush strokes. Nobody, uh, we want to avoid a shooting war, right? Th th that's an ongoing challenge, but that's, you know, they want to li limit Russian influence, probably. Um, there's a lot of statements that, that the United States and Europe want uh, territorial integrity for Georgia. Uh, and if you go by what they say, that's clear. If you go by what they do, it, it's not clear at all. Um, uh, but, 
but, but this all remains vague and, and somewhat poorly thought out. Uh, there is no U.S. or European policy that is distinct from that of, of Tbilisi with regards to Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Now again, that may be because, that may be because they, um, it, it, we all want the same things. Uh, and, and I think that's partially true. There is a lot of, of, of overlap between U.S. and, and uh, Georgian policy in the region, or U.S. And, and Georgian interests and goals in the region, but it's not 100% overlap. And nor, nor necessarily should it be, even though uh, Georgia is and, and should remain an ally. Um, so, so that needs to be articulated more. For example, the issue of limiting Russian influence in the region, I suspect, is shared by both. But that could play itself out differently. For the U.S., that means being open to other final outcomes that do not include annexation and do not include uh, independence as a de facto part of Russia, um, but might include other multi uh, uh, national solutions, other more, more complex solutions. Um, and, and, and I think only Russia seems to pursue a policy that is consistent with these interests. So, so let me just um, move on. Um, there is the, the, the actual policy that is pursued in, in the Western countries is driven largely by, by, by rhetoric and strong statements but little action or meaningful uh, uh, steps to solve the problem. Um, strong words about Georgian territorial in, in integrity and, 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 and weaker words about wanting to resolve conflicts, but they don't do much and they don't have, a, have the ability to change much. And this is saying that the U.S. Senate supports or views of Kazakhstan and South Ossetia as, as occupied territories. You know, I mean, that, that is a statement that, that has some value, but it's not going to solve anything. Um, nor, nor, nor should it be really be expected to solve anything. If it were part of a policy, you might say, okay, there's a, it's a piece of the puzzle. It appears to be, a, you know, too often it's a standalone piece or it doesn't fit in cohesively with the other pieces in the puzzle. Um, moreover, these strong statements in some case only encourage the conflicts, right? They embolden hardliners, in that case in Georgia. Um, they give false hope. The U.S., you know what it is, the consensus among the people that make decisions in Washington that, that, that Russia is occupying part of Georgia. I think anyone that follows the situation closely knows that. That's not news. That's the U.S. position. But to go from there to the notion that, therefore, the U.S. is going to act on that, and therefore, therefore act on, we, we will you know, do something about that, is, is just not accurate. Um, it also makes it harder for the West to have any relationship with the people inside those places because the result of those statements is it gets people's backs up, metaphorically speaking, in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. So instead of being able, so, so and so, it, it, it pushes them in some sense, says, well, look, we've got problems with Russia, but the U.S. is, you know, is 100% is, is with Georgia. We have nowhere else to go here when you probably want to take a different tact, one that might exploit the nascent and in some cases not so nascent divisions uh, between Russia and, and their clients in the region. Um, moreover, some of the proposed solutions, and this goes back to the pre-war of 2008 period, are, are, are just not, are, are proposed as real solutions, but they're, they're, they're solutions that, that kind of essentially are sufficiently one-sided. The solution is Georgia wins. And, and then we'll, we'll kind of back into the details of that from there. And again, that's, you know, that may be what everyone in Washington and Brussels wants, but you're not going to get, it's not going to lead to action or policy or agreement. Um, I want to end with a couple of, of notes. Uh, one is that uh, it's important to keep in mind, because we, a lot of it, when we talk about this, we focus kind of on the region. But if we talk about outs external actors, we have to focus on, for example, those outside countries. And outside actors, and, and particularly distant ones here, that is to say particularly not Russia, because the other, the European uh, foreign policy, United States, States foreign policy is driven much more by kind of democratic, small d democratic considerations, may do less in the near future. There is not a movement in the United States to say, let's get more involved in the rest of the world. Let's try to solve problems around the world. Let's spend a lot of money doing it. I don't think I'm, I'm told those, there's a similar vibe to, uh, in, in, in Europe. Moreover, there's not a lot of money, right? Um, Americans and Americans, uh, you know, are beginning to ask, you know, how much more money should we borrow from the Chinese to try to solve the problem in Nagorno-Karabakh? Um, that's a real question. And that's a real question that many American voters are asking themselves. And that increasingly American elites are going to have to address. Probably, you know, it'll take a while for it to seep up, but eventually they will. There also is the inability that the, 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 we've been there for 20 years. What have we accomplished? 
why are, we, why are we keeping banging our head very expensively against that wall? It's not true for Russia. Russia doesn't have those considerations. The, 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 the relationship between the, the, the wants of the electorate and the decisions the leadership make are, are shall we say, less clear there. Um, I don't think this is good news for the region. Um, and I don't think this is good news for trying to bring some resolution or move things forward. But I think it lends a sense of urgency to the situation. I'm going to end by saying something that those of you who have heard me speak too many times will be surprised. Um, I, I very much agree with, with at least, I, I think, I think, I think Svante and Corey both raised this, but the evidence suggests that at the end of the day, this is not too important to Western powers. It's important to talk about. It's not important to do much about because they really haven't done much. In fact, have been doing less and are likely to do even less. Um, where I'm, and, but, but I think it should be. And it's, it's a mistake to, to, to just kind of walk away from it. We seem content to let these conflicts, conflicts languish among activities that are not all that successful and tired and unproductive rhetoric. That's an on the cheap way to, to work with these conflicts. It's not going to bring any, any, pro, any solutions. There is obviously a paucity of new ideas, big initiatives, e even energy to address these. And um, I, I usually downplay the import of the region, but, but I think these conflicts are important. The U.S. and Europe should care, and, and, and they should try to, to solve some of these problems. Limiting Russian influence and impunity is, is an important goal, and it could have bearing on other emerging powers in other parts of the world. I think everyone can figure that one out. Um, these conflicts or these, or these occupations or these dilemmas, whatever words you want to use, have held back the development of all three South Caucasus states. And, and that's not great either. Moreover, they have provided rationales for all three governments to, for why they can drag their feet on other kinds of reform. We can't think of, more, of liberalizing until we resolve this Nagorno-Karabakh problem. You could hear that in Yerevan or Baku. How can we have how can we move forward with liberalization? We have to be more careful because our territories are occupied. These are things we, we hear, and I don't think, I don't particularly buy that, but um, it's, it certainly is a legitimate argument that, that people make, and it certainly gets a lot of, it, it is an appealing one for many people. Um, the potential for war is real, and the potential for bigger wars than we've seen in the past is real. There's, there's dominoes that could fall that can mean that the next time people shooting at each other, it's not just you know, people in Nagorno-Karabakh shooting at each other. There are other powers that can get involved, and I don't think anybody wants to see that. Um, there's a real need to get this right and rethink most of it, and I think we're quite distant uh, from that goal right now. Thank you, Lincoln. I'd like to turn quickly to the question periods before the hunger pains for lunch get too sharp. So I'd like to remind everybody to please approach the microphone and introduce yourself. Thank you, um, Inga Snip, Uppsala University. Um, I have actually three questions. Um, I'll start with um, the order that the presentations were being given. Um, first of all, I have a question to uh, Christopher Borgen about the ruling of the ICJ that the, the uh, declarance of independence as such is not illegal and how does this, in international law, how this judicially affects um, other, um, the rest, how does it affect recognition, how does it affect succession, etc. Um, then my second question is for Corey Weld about um, there were uh, two proposals um, that were signed in 96 and or one proposal that was signed in 96 um, where the, the territories within Georgia, Abkhazia and Ossetia were given a huge amount of autonomy which were being in the end rejected by these uh, territories although also signed by, by Russia. Um, what are your opinions on, and then the, the peace plan of March 2008, the proposal by Georgia to give more uh, autonomy to, to Abkhaz and Ossetia, how does this um, fit in with the framework, how, um, how can we see these proposals, are they really sincere, or were they really sincere proposals, or um, your opinion about that please. And then my last is for uh, Lincoln, um, always a little bit provocative in your, um, in your uh, speeches. Uh, my question is, uh, don't you think that uh, when there's an economic situation which, which is like in a really deep situation like, right it, like as it is right now, um, countries tend to be, become more inward. Tendencies and, 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 um, of, and opinions of the people tend to be more inward. People want to focus on themselves, they see 
they don't want to spend money on other people, whereas when it goes economically rather well with a country, the, the, these tendencies and these perceptions and these views change. So don't you agree with me that the, in the possible future, uh, most likely the opinion of the American voters and European voters will change in this perspective? Um, please your view on that. Thank you. Let's collect a few questions unless somebody feels strongly that they want to answer from the panel. OK, let's, let's collect a few questions then, please. Um, I'm Padma Desai, I'm the Harriman Professor at Columbia University. I would like to follow up on the last question uh, raised by the previous uh, questioner. Uh, that, ha that has been a sharp in inward change in U.S. policy making uh, with respect to Russia uh, in the post-Soviet space. Uh, and it has changed from uh, the very confrontational uh, Bush-Cheney style and substance of dissolving issues with Russian leadership to a more um, bargaining and more cooperative stance uh, under the Obama administration. Uh, and that precedes the economic crisis uh, which has hit us uh, here. Um, uh, and I think that there is a, a recognition of commonality of interests in Washington uh, with Russia on nuclear non-proliferation, on terrorism control, or fighting the war in Afghanistan for which Russia has provided uh, transit routes uh, for the U.S. Uh, uh, the result has been there for the signing of the reset button uh, by Clinton and Lavrov on March 6, uh, 2009. Do you see any uh, sort of um, uh, would you like to respond to uh, my position that there is, a, uh, there is a very sharp internal change in U.S. policy making uh, and how to deal with Russia? Thank you very much, Sergei Markedonov, CSIS. Uh, first of all, let me thank all participants for terrific presentations. I disagree with most of thesis. But it's good because it's a good opportunity to develop, to strengthen my own argumentation. I have three questions. The first one is uh, addressed to Chris. Uh, what do you think uh, about the role of interpretation of international law? It seems to me without interpretations, interpreters, and the uh, will of key actors, it's a number of mixture of very controversial points, which would be applied in this way, in such a way, in that way, for example, case of Croatia recognition. Montevideo declaration was used in this case, but in the case of Abkhazia, another Balkan case, it was not used, and, and so on. And I have uh, other two questions to Swante. The first one is very simple and primitive. Uh, how could you define uh, the term uh, conflict resolution? It seems to me uh, you identify this term with uh, a resolution in favor of Georgia, Azerbaijan, Moldova, it seems to me it's uh, not the only option. There is a variety of different options. Finally, how could you uh, identify this very simple term? Uh, the second question concerns uh, concrete case Nagorno-Karabakh and the Russia's role in this resolution. You criticized Russia for ineffectiveness, uh, like mediator, you are not alone in this uh, process, uh, but uh, how will uh, Russia have to behave in this situation, in your view? What resources uh, must Russia use in order to be considered like a positive mediator in this conflict? Thank you. Alex Cooley of Barnard and Harriman Institute. Uh, thank you to you all. Just a brief question, mostly for Corey and Sponte, if you want to take a whack at it, because I talk to Lincoln about this all the time. Um, what would U.S. policy towards engaging with especially um, the separatist conflicts in Georgia look like under a Romney administration? I mean, are there uh, concrete things that can change policy-wise? Would it just be a matter of sort of style? Would it be a kind of elevation of Tbilisi in the international sphere? I mean, sort of what exact kind of mechanisms could you foresee that would be different, say, this time next year, if indeed there is a President Romney, than there is at a moment? I'd be really interested to hear your take on it. Thanks. Okay, 
we're just going to go in order. Um, thank you for uh, for two uh, very interesting questions. The the first question, um, going back to the to the first speaker, is the having to do with the the decision of the International Court of Justice in regards to Kosovo, which of course has been very important politically um, in regards to uh, attitudes not only in the, the conflicts that we've been looking at today, but also other sort of nationalist issues around the world. Um, and the question is how did this decision, or did this decision, affect issues having to do with recognition, secession, and so on? Um, so briefly, because this is actually a fairly big topic. Um, from the point of view of an international lawyer, that is in terms of substantive international law, the decision of the International Court of Justice in regards to Kosovo did almost nothing. Um, it actually essentially said what was obvious to international lawyers. Now why is that the result? And I think in part what's interesting is not the decision itself by the court, but rather the, what led up to the decision and then the stuff that happened after the decision. So, the reason that the decision of the International Court of Justice didn't say very much is because the question that it was presented was one that for many people would probably have, for many international lawyers, would have a fairly obvious answer. The question, and I don't have it in front of me, but it said essentially, um, is, the is the unilateral declaration of independence by the provisional organs of governance of Kosovo um, consistent with international law. So is a declaration of independence consist, is this declaration of independence consistent with international law? Um, but that's not really the issue. That's not what people were concerned about. Uh, it's not in terms of issues of declarations of independence. The, the two issues that people were really concerned about in regards to Kosovo were either, is secession a legal remedy under international law for the situation that was in Kosovo? And or, uh, the other question would be, is the recognition of Kosovo illegal mm -hmm. because of what it was do because a recognition would be somehow um, uh, would somehow be an intervention in a domestic uh, political concern? Neither of those were the questions that were actually asked. Why? I, I, I don't know for a fact. Why not? But my guess is this: um, to have the question go before the International Court of Justice. Um, this was not a suit. Th so this wasn't anybody suing anybody else. This is what's called an advisory opinion. So it's a request from the General Assembly to the International Court of Justice for guidance on international law for the General Assembly's then further consideration of the issue. So you have to get this voted out of the General Assembly to the International Court of Justice. So if the question was, is recognition illegal? Well, by the time the question went up, something at least, I think about 40 states by that point had recognized Kosovo. So you're not going to get those votes of those 40 states, because if the International Court of Justice says, yes, it's illegal, well, the, those 40 states have just put themselves in a point of saying, oh, well, gee, we just asked a question. Thank you for telling us that we're acting illegally. Mm -hmm. So that's not going to be the question that's going to be presented, yeah. right? So instead, and then, and no, there was no enthusiasm by any country that has a, a nationalist conflict within it to ask whether or not secession can be uh, an actual remedy. So you're not gonna get, I mean, you're not gonna get Spain to ask that question, you're not going to get Romania to ask that question, you're not gonna get most states that have some type of na sub-nationalist group within there. So instead, the question that was devised was a relatively plain vanilla question, and my guess was, the hope was, that the judges of the International Court of Justice would choose to sort of take this question and say, yeah, that's an okay question, but really there's some interesting underlying issues which we want to get to. And they didn't want to do that. So, or most of them didn't want to do that. Some did in dissenting opinions and touched on that, but most of them didn't want to do that. So they took this sort of very plain question and they said what's the, essentially the plain answer, which is, you know what, Declaration of Independence occur all the time. Um, the, the, the declarant, that is the subnational group is not a regulated entity under international law. International law primarily regulates states. So if a group of people want to get together in a state and declare independence, that's up to them. It might be an issue in terms of the constitutional law of that state, but it's not an issue in terms of international law. So you've got an opinion which said almost nothing. I think the politics leading up to the asking of the opinion is more interesting than the opinion itself. I think what's also really interesting is what happened to the opinion afterwards, because in the rhetoric, it was, you know, Kosovo's, you know, Kosovo's independence is found to be legal and all this, that's, that's beyond what the ICJ was saying. Um, so the rhetorical result of the Kosovo opinion was much more important than, or much bigger than the legal result. In other words, sort of the blast furnace of politics, once again, you know, mu you know overwhelming the sort of the snowflake of sort of, you know, like legal reasoning that was within it, in which the lawyers would say, eh, this opinion, eh, not, not such a big deal. Um, 
the second question, and I'll just uh, answer this one briefly. What is the role of interpretation in international law? And so this relates in part to the, to the answer that I was just giving. Um, the question here is what I would call not only interpretation, but auto-interpretation. So the interpretation by an interested state in regards to the legal issues here. Um, as a basic level, what I would say the role of interpretation is uh, states are always going to be concerned about providing an interpretation that passes the laugh test. So if you're going to sort of re venture to the realm of saying something about international law, you're not going to want to say something that is just obviously wrong, um, that to which you could be easily called out by other states. It's part of the broader issue of diplomatic discourse. Um, related to that, though, there's the, the issues in which your interpretation might lead to results down the line if other states pick up your interpretation. So there's going to be a concern about you being affected by your own interpretation in a way that you wouldn't like to have in the future. I'll take an example outside of these conflicts. There's actually some very fairly good evidence that when the US invaded Grenada, when the US went into Grenada uh, in the early 80s, they were very concerned about the legal interpretation they would take in terms of why they entered into Grenada because they didn't want to have the Soviet Union be able to take that same interpretation and enter into various countries in Eastern Europe, which is why we went through the whole thing of bringing in, um, bringing in leaders from, I think it was the Canadian, uh, from, uh, from the Caribbean, and having it as a regional organization that was asking for the US to intervene. Because the US wanted to be able to say, look, this is, a, this is due to a regional organization that's asked us to intervene. This is not something we're doing unilaterally. You're concerned about appreciating the reciprocal. What happens when your, your own interpretation gets used against your own interests? Um, the closing point that I'll say is that on the issue of recognition of Croatia versus recognition of South Ossetia. I actually think that the legal issue there was a little bit different, Sergei, uh, Sergei than what you'd mentioned. The recognition of Croatia was, even though first you had sort of Germany stepping out ahead, but in terms of the EU as a whole, when the e EU or the EC at the time began to move on the interpretation of Croatia, it was because the Badinter Commission had given the sort of the framework of saying Yugoslavia is in a state of dissolution. There is no longer a pre-existing state. And at that point, what we have to consider is what is existing on this territory. That's not the case in terms of Georgia. Georgia exists as a pre-existing state. Georgia has not dissolved. So issues of recognizing an entity within Georgia um, is sort of is within a different legal framework than, um, than uh, the findings that were here in terms of, of, of Yugoslavia. And of course, people will, will quibble in terms of whether or not Yugoslavia was dissolving or not. But it sets, up the, it sets up the issues in a completely different way, which is why the issue of Croatia was an issue of dissolution, and the issue of South Ossetia is, is, issue, is an issue of secession, and two completely different frameworks, if you look at it those way in terms of international law. Okay, uh, first on the question of the peace plans, were they sincere? Are they potential bases for reconciliation or resolution? Uh, I, I think the peace plans were sincere. I think the Georgians in particular genuinely gave a lot of thought to the development of those plans at various points in time and are prepared to give the kinds of powers of self-government that they put on paper, I think. Uh, and and underappreciated in the Georgian case is the degree to which Georgians uh, came around to South Ossetian self-governance. Uh, the, con the, the, the legal notion of South Ossetia had been abolished. The name had been abolished from popular consciousness for so many years and began to creep back. Uh, but there's, there's just, there, I don't think that peace plans that emerge from Moldova, from Tbilisi, Chisinau, or Baku will ever be the basis for a resolution for a number of reasons, but two briefly that I want to highlight. One is, is the question of trust. Uh, and that's, there's many levels to that. One, of course, is the mere fact of mixed messages. Uh, to take the starkest example, Zeri is saying we're willing to grant Nagorno-Karabakh the highest level of autonomy possible, uh, and at the same time be doing the kind of saber rattling that they've been doing makes it very difficult for the other side to accept. And that was the case even in, in the Georgian case all these years. But it's also, of course, the question of trust over time. How do we ensure that the promises that they give now they'll keep to tomorrow? Um, but there's also a very important question of status and this notion of delegating autonomy or delegating self-government from the capitals, we're pretty much past that. Um, I, I still hold the notion of thinking of those regions as local governments, but the, the, the thinking is about how to bring those local governments back into some form of unification, and that's going to require 
a, a different kind of process than a center delegating powers. There's going to be some sort of treaty-based element uh, to it. I, I, tre not treaty, but the terms that you were using. Uh, something slightly below a treaty. Um, on, on Romney G, we're out of time. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, just, I mean, this gets back to sort of the reset thing. These things ebb and flow. Candidates will say lots of things and think about policy in lots of different ways before they enter into an administration, and then the realities of administration take over. I think there are two issues to think about very carefully, though. One is whether a Republican Romney administration uh, would cancel the reset, and what would that mean? Uh, they're going to find that there are lots of uh, uh, ways in which we've gotten into the reset that might be difficult to extricate ourselves from, especially if we don't extricate ourselves from Afghanistan. Uh, but that possibility is there. The other possibility is, uh, is about being a, a greater willingness to provide weapons to Georgia. And I think that's a big issue that hasn't gone away. It will come back much more, uh, particularly under Republican administration. But again, the promises of campaigns may look different than the responsibilities of administration. Uh, Republican administrations also weren't as willing as it might seem to provide Georgians with uh, weapons, but certainly the stage will be set for that. Uh, and whether they can do that in a delicate way that does not uh, endanger the uh, environment of the region would be a question. But I think those are the two things to at least look for. Thank you. Um, on conflict resolution, it's both easy and not easy, Sergey. I think the easy answer to your question is that conflict resolution would amount to a mutual agreement between the parties to the conflict, not undertaken under duress, but voluntarily. Um, that is not, well, under duress it might be, um, rather, not under the duress inflicted by an external force. Um, over the issues of the territorial status of these territories and possibly over power sharing. So, uh, to me it's not necessarily, I mean, in whose advantage uh, it is. I mean, if there is a Georgian government that comes to power in 10 years and say, you know what, we don't want these territories anymore. Uh, and say, here you are, have your independence. And if that's a mutual agreement, then that's conflict resolution. If there is an Abkhaz government that one day says, you know what, let's sign on to a confederal solution and the Georgian government accepts that, that's also conflict resolution. In reality, I think the problem is a little different in the different conflicts. The problem, especially in uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, is that it's not one conflict. It's actually three conflicts. Uh, you have a Georgian-Russian conflict, which has absorbed, if you will, the other, the, the lower level conflicts. You have intrastate conflicts and you have interstate conflicts. And these are interlinked with one another in such a way that I don't think you can resolve one without resolving the other. In between Armenia and Azerbaijan, I think it's very different because there everybody knows the outlines of a solution. The problem is not what the solution is going to be. Yes, there are details. When will, what will happen to the Lachin Corridor? When will Kelbajar be vacated? What happens first? Economic ties or withdrawal of of Armenian uh, forces, how is the, uh, is it police or peacekeeping or what, I mean these are all details. But uh, on the whole, there is general I think agreement, if you look at what the actual disagreements in the talks are, they are very limited disagreements. They're important disagreements but they're very limited. The problem is not about the, uh, the actual, not so much I should say, about the actual uh, paragraphs, if you will, uh, of an agreement, but about the context, about the political context of an agreement, about the political will in the two powers, uh, in the two countries, Armenia and Azerbaijan, and the role and influence of the foreign powers involved. Um, on, on your question on uh, Russian policy, I think my answer would be uh, for Russia to be understood as a, as a serious, honest broker, uh, Russia would have to abandon its ambitions for a sphere of influence. You cannot have an ambition of a sphere of influence over territories and at the same time be understood as an honest broker between these powers. That to me is, it's incongruent. So in a sense, um, if you look at it spe specifically uh, regarding the Armenian-Azerbaijan conflict, I would say while Russia is pursuing policies in Moldova and in Georgia that are the way they are, it will be very difficult for the parties to that conflict to think that we are treated, that Russia has very different ambitions as regards to one part of the South Caucasus or the former Soviet sphere compared to what it has in our neighboring territory, for example. 
That would be my main answer. Now in Romney, I think it would actually be much more interesting perhaps in the Gingrich administration because there you'll have, yeah. you'll have a lot of ideas, certainly. Whether they'll be good or bad is a different, different story. But I think the, uh, more seriously, I think the answer is that um, the policy on Georgia will be very different, but the policies on the conflicts might not be directly very different. Indirectly, because Georgia policy will be different, you'll also find implications for the conflicts, and I think especially it will be regard. I mean, arms issues are symbolic in my mind. It's not necessarily that the, the Georgians want to uh, have all their arms coming from the U.S., but it's a symbolic. I mean, it was eight, nine million dollars a year. I mean, this is peanuts, even for Georgia. Uh, the amount of sales, you know, weapon sales that that the U.S. was providing, but the fact that after the war it goes down to zero. That's the symbolic importance. So the restoration at a symbolic or non-symbolic level of arms sales, I think, would be only a normal thing to happen, but I don't think that's the main thing. The main thing that I think would happen is that there would, if, the, if there would be a ramped up security cooperation that would provide an implicit, not explicit, uh, greater levels of security, uh, feelings of security for the Georgian for the Georgians in terms of their international position, if you like, or their security position. That would be what would in the long term change. But I don't, I don't think it means that a Republican administration would suddenly have great ideas about what they would do about Abkhazia or South Ossetia, because frankly, nobody has great ideas about this at this point. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Sorry, Thanks. Um, a couple of points. First, Pablo's question about the change in, in between the Bush and Obama administration. I mean, um, I think, first of all, it's, you know, the relationships between the Russia and the United States got very bad at the very end of the Bush administration. But the first two years, it was not, you know, it, it took a while to kind of get like that. So you have to remember that. Um, so uh, I, I don't think the change is, I think the change is largely one of style. Um, we still need things from Russia that we needed, you know, eight, six, five, whatever years ago. Uh, we still get those things. Um, we still provide assistance to our friends and allies in the region. We still take the same positions. On, I mean, I mean the, 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 the Obama administration has worked very hard to support, with, worked very hard with Georgia towards the diplomatic goal of limiting recognition to Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And I think that's a Georgian diplomatic victory in that there's been so little, so few countries recognizing, and a victory in which maybe the United States played, played a part. Uh, it's hard to imagine the Bush administration would have done it differently. It's hard to imagine the Bush, I mean, obviously the Bush administration wasn't going to run around and seek recognition for these places. Um, and that's what, and neither did the Obama administration. So the continuity here is, is, is probably a bigger factor than, than, than might initially strike, strike us. Um, I'm not going to answer Alex's question. I talk to him all the time, as he said. But um, I'd be happy to tell you what it looked like in a Ron Paul administration. Um, <laughs> uh, with, with regards to Inga's question, I, a couple things that come to mind. First, it's not obvious the economy is in the United States and Europe are going to turn around substantially anytime soon. We may be living in a new reality now, And so, firstly. Secondly, if the economies turn around, it may, because of, it may be come with some changes in our own political system. So we may turn around because we begin investing in domestic issues more. Um, and thirdly, even before 2008, right, even before uh, the, the economic crisis in which we now find ourselves really began, the notion of the American, uh, the, the American hegemon was changing, the role of the American hegemon, the extent of the American hegemon was changing. So we were entering slowly a more multilateral world. We were entering a world where, where the, the United States' ability to influence outcomes almost without opposition in some cases in, in many parts of the world was changing. And with that change, even if there's money to, even if there's resources to spend money on that, with that change comes people getting disillusioned. Why, why are we doing this? And the tension on the domestic side of things is that, and this is summed up by, I think, uh, uh, the governor of Texas whose position on foreign assistance, foreign, I don't mean to make fun of him, he's this person who's too easy of a target, but, but secondly, because I think these people represent real, real ideas and, and, and real, visions that the American people often share, but is that we have this kind of, um, you know, we don't have a place in the sun, but we are the indispensable nation, to, as Madeleine Albright of all people said, but, 
I shouldn't say of all people, it's Madeleine Albright said, but, but, but Rick Perry, for example, and he's an illustrative example of this, shares that view. We have a special role. The United States should be a world actor. And at the same time, he says, maybe we should stop offering foreign assistance. Those two ideas are not congruous. But that gives you a sense of, of how both ordinary people and elites are playing with this. And I don't think, with these ideas, I don't think the outcome is going to be to redouble our efforts to resolve conflicts in far-flung parts of the world or redouble our assistance broadly to, to, to faraway parts. No. No, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's both about, about diminishing resources, but I think a diminishing confidence on the side of the American people that we can achieve these things. So therefore, why, why bother? Corey, you'd like to add a final comment? Yeah, sorry about that. But I, but I did also want to keep have us remember that it's not just about the U.S., but that Russia also is changing. And the regime might not be changing, and the regime might be the same as it's been in Medvedev's time and before that, but the relationship between the state and society has been changing dramatically, and it's very difficult to predict what that's going to look like. And regardless of whether Democrats or Republicans are in power, what happens in Russia is going to affect uh, dramatically the relationship uh, and possibly what happens to the region. Thank you. I'd like to thank the panelists for a very interesting set of comments and the audience for attending. And now we'll take our lunch break.